Hi everyone, welcome to Premiere Video Tutorial Part 3, um, Titles and Effects. So let's get cracking with this one and uh, I'll show you what's going to be in this session. So we have um, text, so I'll be showing you the Legacy Title Tool. Um, as with a lot of things in Premiere, which I've discussed before, there are several ways to do uh, text. Um, I'll just be going through this main one today, uh, but I'll briefly touch on the others too. Um, then we have motion effects, namely frame hold and speed effects. Then geometry effects. Then transitions. Video filters. And finally, color grading with Lumetri. Um, so with Lumetri, um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on how to color grade. It's mainly showing you um, how the actual Lumetri part of Premiere works. Um, there will be a another color grading tutorial at some point, which goes into a bit more detail about actual color grading. Um, but for now, this is just showing you how to get the Lumetri tool to work. Okay, so text, the legacy title tool. So um, let's get into Premiere. To use the legacy title tool, I need to go up to File, New, Legacy Title. Okay. Um, once I select Legacy Title, I get this sort of new title window, which has just got a couple of little settings um, that I need to go through first. In actual fact, these settings are are taken straight from the sequence settings you have. So, um, assuming that your sequence settings are correct, which they should be, um, then you shouldn't change anything in this um, in the settings part so I, I want to keep the resolution as is 1920 by 1080 I want to keep the time um, the time base as 25 frames a second and pixel aspect ratio is, is correct too um, so the only thing I can change here is the name of this uh, title um, so obviously it kind of numbers them, um, but if I end up with a lot of titles um, in my video, then uh, the, the, the numbers aren't going to be that descriptive. So I can just, um, it's probably best to call this, you know, a more descriptive title. So this could be my opening title credit. Um, so once I've just decided on that, I can click OK, and I get this title window here. Um, might not always look like this when you open it up, actually. Um, so next to where it says opening title credit, or that that's the name that I've just given it. So next to where it says title. Is it is a one of the three line menus? So if I click on there, and I'm just going to go and select all of these items to make sure that they're all visible. Because this is more like what will probably open up the first time you open uh, the legacy title window. Um, so it's just a matter of selecting the type tool, clicking on the type tool, clicking on the screen and something like that. Um, so I, I'm not going to go through all of this, um, everything in here, because this is, you know, th this is all stuff that you'll see in, in most text-based um, software. So, you know, uh, you'll, you'll have your font, um, then your font size, um, etc. Um, you've got aspects, leading, kerning, and tracking, all of those things. Um, you know, 
if you want to just type in these numbers or you can use the slider to move up um, this kind of thing kerning and tracking um, and then font size I think I mentioned that one you can uh, do that there uh, if you want to move the text around you select the arrow tool or the selection tool and then you can grab that um, text box and place it wherever you want um, so you can see these sort of two boxes um, on your um, screen um, so these are what we call title safe areas um, so because um, lots of different televisions may or may not um, sort of crop in slightly from the edge pixels, um, you might get slightly fewer pixels on your TV than, than, are, than are actually there. And certainly that's the case when you... Um, when you use a, a, an old CRT television, which I don't know if they even exist anymore now, actually, but um, the uh, the best way to explain what this does is um, on on a CRT television, because the edges are kind of you know the, the screens themselves are, are slightly rounded, um, so that they've they've cropped some of the edge pixels off, um, uh, so. Uh, to make sure that your text doesn't get cropped you know if you put your text right down here then you might lose some of it um, in the cropping so to ensure that that doesn't happen if you put your titles inside the text the title safe area then you know that um, they'll never get cropped to guarantee that you don't crop any of your texts you should put it inside the title safe area um, it's not such a, an issue anymore. Um, televisions don't tend to crop pixels out um, like they used to. Uh, so um, it's not 100% necessary. Um, but just so you're aware of, of, of what it does. Um, okay. So you'll, you'll also see that I have an image in my... Um, in my uh, in my text screen here and that image is basically just the same as the image underneath where my playhead is on my timeline so if I move the playhead through the timeline then it will move through the image in my text tool as well and I can Make this text box smaller actually by grabbing the corner just so I can see what's going on. Um, so that follows um, the playhead. Uh, and if I take my playhead completely off the end of my clips or off the end of my film, then I get a black screen. Um, so if, if you want your title to be over a black screen, because um, the title screen itself is um, has an alpha channel, which means it's 100% opaque. Wherever you place a playhead, like I said, the image will show through. Um, so if you did want to put your title on um, uh, on a black screen, then I'll show you how to do that. Um, so once you've created the actual text, it doesn't matter where the playhead is for now. Um, so all you do is once you've got your text um, where you want it and how you want it, you can just click, I think you can change the color as well, colors and all sorts of things. Um, so I can draw shapes on there as well. Um, so I just closed down this, this window, this separate window here. And now inside my, um, uh, my project browser window, I have my, my credit file here and what I'm going to do first off is right click new bin titles <clears throat> so now I've got a titles bin 
and I can put my little credit in there, close that down, keep it neat. Um, so if I want this on my timeline, I just literally drag it over there and there it is. Uh, I, can, I can edit this clip in the same way that you edit any other clip. Um, using the tools, etc. I can extend it and all this. I can add uh, I can add transitions or I'll show you those later. Um, so if I've got my title man I maybe want that there, but I want that over a black screen, then what I'll have to do is cut the video track underneath it and remove that track there so now my opening credit will play over black okay and if I want to edit my title if I've decided I, I, I if I made a spelling mistake or I need to change it somehow or just want to change the position I can just double click this clip and it will open up my um, title tool again. Okay, so that is the legacy title. Um, there's a couple of other ways you can add titles. Um, literally with the text tool in the toolbar here, I can just literally type on the screen. Okay, um, and if I want to do anything with that, then I double click that clip, go into effects controls, and I've got a few little options here about where I can move it. Um, so yeah, I can I can drag that around there, um, and and move this text wherever I want it. Um, so that's that's one way of adding text. But um, you are limited slightly um, with with certain things. Uh, if you want to have color the text, you you'll need to color grade it. Uh, um, I think I think that's the only way you can do it. Um, so yeah, there there are there are limitations using that, um, and you don't get shapes or anything like that. Um, so there you go. Uh, that's another way of adding text. Um, and then the final way, um, if we go to to this little extender arrow here and click on there and go to graphics. And select graphics then we have these quite um, quite cool animated versions of text uh, some of them are animated some of them are sort of set out in specific ways it's just a matter of dragging those directly out of there and onto your timeline um, got some missing fonts uh, if, if there are missing fonts the um, it will just select a, a, a different font and, and use that um, so I don't know if you can see that it's quite small um, so you've got options there again it's quite difficult to get in and edit this as it is um, so again if I double click this you you can change all of the parameters down here um, at this time you have lots and lots of um, different parameters. The reason we show you uh, legacy title over these two is um, it, it's, it's kind of uh, in between in terms of uh, operability. So there are limitations with typing straight on the screen and with these fancy animated ones these get quite involved. Um, so um, you know often most of what you want to do is available within the legacy title text tool 
Um, but if you do want to get a bit fancier, you go for it with these um, graphics tools. Um, or you can just select, clicking on the browse or edit, um, select something else. There's lots of different ones, but that's up to you to uh, get in there and have a play with those. Uh, so there we go, there's titles, um, so let's move on. Frame hold and speed effects. Um, so let's go back into Premiere. So frame hold is what we call in Premiere, that's, um, it's how you add or create a still image from your video clip. So you may have, there are a couple of ways to do it as well. So this is a moving um, video clip. And if I decide that I get to this clip and I want from this point on, I want that to be a still image. And I just want that still image to play out for the rest of that clip. So I right click here and I go add frame hold. And that has turn the rest of my video clip into a still image. So that is now a still. The sound still plays, um, but the image is, is now a still image. Okay, and that will literally just create the still for as long as your video clip um, plays out. Okay, to the end of that clip. So that's one way of adding um, a frame hold. Another way, let me just undo that. Another way is to go again, right click, insert frame hold segment. And that basically uh, cuts your clip wherever the playhead is and um, inserts a still image, um, a still of wherever the playhead was. Um, so, so I play this now. There's a still, and then continues to play the the rest of that video clip. That is a clip of two seconds, um, and there's probably a way to change that default somewhere in the menus, um, but. Uh, there's no real need to because you can always edit that um, clip to be longer, shorter, however you want. Um, because it's unlikely if you change the default length that the next time you do it, you're going to want exactly the same length anyway. So um, it makes sense just to be able to edit that um, in the same way that you would edit any other clip. Okay. Um, and then finally, if I right click again and go frame hold options. So now I get this frame hold window and I get a few little options basically. I can create a hold on source time code. So um, that's whatever I've put in there. Uh, sequence time code I can um, create my hold on the in point on the out point or where the playhead is okay so there are just a few options um, for you to play with there um, so this is the most versatile um, but you know it, it's not exactly uh, rocket science the frame hold part so um, you know it, it might be just that you need to create a frame hold and then get in there and edit it um, how I've just shown you previously okay so that's frame hold I'll just cancel that so now speed options again there are a few ways to get in and change speed in your clips um, one of them is if I double click my clip, go over to effects controls and just close these down a little bit. I've got a, um, a few little effects on here already, so just ignore those if you can. Um, 
this little drop down menu here time remapping this is a way you can change the speed of your clip um and i'll i'll if you want to do that i'll let you get involved with this it, it by creating a keyframe in a couple of places and changing the velocity in between them moving this you can um speed up your clips um uh, you know they can speed up and slow down over time by using these keyframes um, i'll show you keyframes in a bit more detail uh, in a minute so uh yeah I'll, I'll leave you to have a go with that you know you can extend these out and you have your uh, bezier curves and all kinds of things um it, it does get very complicated um uh so if you want to know more about that then perhaps if you get in touch with me i can show you in more detail um it's a bit too much to go into right here um just so you know that it is available okay so um the more basic speed controls are if you select your clip and go command r and you get this speed duration window open so any clip at playing at normal speed and forwards will be a hundred percent um any clip slowed down will be less than 100%. So 20% and OK. And you can see how that clip has suddenly extended quite considerably. Let's go back to our editing tab. So that is now quite a lot longer than it was. Um, it'll be 80% longer um, because we've slowed it down to 20% of its original speed. Um, and that is much slower now. Um, so, let me just go back in there. Command R again. Um, so that's down to 20%. You have this thing down the bottom, time interpolation. So there's frame sampling, frame blending, and optical flow. Um, these are these will smooth out the motion in your um, in your in your uh, slowed down clips. Um, so frame blending is probably the best average one to go for. So let's go for that and click OK, see if it makes a better job. Uh, no, basically, is the answer to that. Um, these things sometimes work really well and sometimes don't. Um, so you've got frame blending as an option, command R, or optical flow. Optical flow is for when you're doing really slow motion, so down to like 5% or something like that. Um, it basically sort of samples the, f the in between the two frames and tries to animate kind of what's in between those frames. Sometimes it gets it horribly wrong um, and you get all sort of weird pixels all over the place or weird parts of the image being duplicated and it can make a real mess of it. Um, but sometimes it gets it really spot on and you get this super slow motion and super... Um, super smooth as well uh, unfortunately it's really difficult to know when um, as and when that's going to work um, so uh, it's just a matter of trial and error and once you understand what those things are um, then then you'll know which works and which doesn't um, okay so um, so like I said 20% is slowed down. Anything above 100% is speeded up. So 200% will make my clip twice as fast and therefore half as long. Um, and then let's go back to that again. Command R. I can type in a duration um, rather than a percentage. Um, 
if I add a minus on the beginning of this, that will actually reverse my clip as well. Or I could just click the reverse um, button there like that. I think if I check reverse box and have a minus, then it will probably reverse it twice, and therefore putting it back to the normal way around again. Um, so yeah, you can reverse clips, uh, or you can go, so this thing here, ripple edit, so let's see what this does. Um, so let's say, um, let's cancel this for a second and undo and undo and undo. So we're back where we were. Um, command R, let's click ripple and put this to 20% like we did before and OK. OK, same thing happened there. Oops. Command R. Uh, 200% with ripple ticked and OK, OK. So um, the ripple edit and shifting trailing clips uh, tick box uh, it, it only works when you have um, multiple clips in the timeline. So I'll probably show you this just by making an edit in here, actually. Um, so if I just put an edit there and go Command R. So I'm going to slow this clip down, Command R. Um, if I slow that down to 20% and I've got ripple edit ticked, and I click OK. So that, as, as you can see, it's pushed the clip after it. It's pushed it further down my timeline. If I just undo that, and now Command-R, untick ripple edit, speed 20%, OK. So it looks like nothing has happened, but that clip is much slower. It's slowed down, but it just hasn't moved. It hasn't pushed the clip out of the way, and therefore it hasn't extended that clip. It's just kept the edit exactly as it was, but it slowed down that clip in the middle. It works the other way as well. Let's, let's just undo that back to where it was. So Command R, if I go 200%, um, and don't click ripple edit, click OK. So that's made my clip shorter, but it hasn't rippled my timeline. It hasn't moved my timeline, it's just left a gap there. Um, let's do that again, undo there, and 200% and tick ripple and OK. And now you can see it's rippled my timeline, it's, um, it's made my clip shorter and it's kept the edit point as it is, but just moved, rippled that clip down. Okay. Um, the more you get into this, the more you, the more you work with it, the more you use it, the, the more um, it will make sense uh, and the more obvious all of these things become. Okay, so that's speed effects and um, frame holds. Okay, so geometry effects. Let's have a look at some geometry effects in Premiere. Let's go to, uh, let me just undo everything actually. Undo, 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 undo. Um, so I'll double click my clip in the timeline and I'm going to go to effect controls 
and my geometry effects are what I call what the these um, effects here so anything under motion so position scale rotation and anchor point um, and I guess you could call opacity as well um, so it's anything the, uh, that affects the shape and position of your image so um, there's a few ways I can affect this I can with a position let's let's work with scale so that's fairly an obvious one that's going to make my clip bigger or smaller so I can um, anything again above a hundred hundred percent is going to make my clip bigger so 200 bump that zoomed right in and anything below 100 is going to make it smaller 50 so that's um, just be aware that this the dark area over here the black is is my actual frame size so when I export this I'm going to see um, I'm not just going to see a smaller video I'm going to see a, a, a black border around my video so this is still my frame size but my video is just uh, smaller inside that frame size um, so there you go I can just do that by like I said typing in the numbers typing them in or I can click on the number and drag it up and down to make it bigger and smaller or if I select the actual um, parameter then I can go over here and drag that in and out to make it bigger and smaller and that goes the same with any of these if I, I can I can type the numbers in drag the numbers around or I can click on the the word itself and I've got access to all of these functions then um, and rotate is even in here somewhere uh, um, I can't find it but it's it's in there somewhere um, there it is yeah so that kind of arrow uh, a 90 degree arrow there you go, there's rotate. Um, okay, so as well as being able to um, move all these uh, parameters individually, I can also affect them over time. So that's basically animate these parameters. So I can make the, the scale of this video change over time. I can make it grow and shrink just as the timeline's playing back. And the way that I do that is, so I'll go to scale again. Um, so this little section here is represents the length of my clip. And this represents the timeline, the playhead, sorry. Um, so I go back somewhere to the beginning of my clip. And when you add your first keyframe in so we're working with keyframes now I need to click this little toggle animation looks a bit like a stopwatch I suppose um, if you click on there and now it's added a little keyframe in my timeline you also notice that this appeared add and remove keyframes so next I can just move my playhead along and now I can just add another keyframe using this this little button here and because I know that I, my playhead is exactly over there because I've literally just done it I can now add my additional number in there and now if I move my playhead between the two you'll see that they it animates between those two points so if I just play that back it will zoom in to that clip as it's playing along okay 
and that will work for any of these parameters. I can animate them th exactly the same way for any single one of these. And it also works for pretty much any video effect. Um, you can use keyframes to animate all of your video effects. Any parameter that has a little toggle animation icon next to it means that you can um, you can use that to animate that um, that particular parameter. So there we go. That's geometry effects. So transition effects. Um, Transitions very simple. Let's go into Premiere. Um, it's just a matter of literally um, how two clips kind of blend together. Um, so uh, I could really do with two separate clips here. Actually, I tell you what. What I'll do is. Um, and leave that one there so you can see the difference in between those two so the, 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 the way to add the default transition is select your edit point right click on your edit point apply default transition um, and the default default transition is what we call a cross dissolve so that's basically just a fade between one and the other but what you'll notice is that cross dissolve only appeared on one side and why is that um, and the reason for that is because there aren't any frames after there. It's the very end of that clip. So that's why it it can't create a fade where there are no additional frames. Okay, so if you imagine the two clips are sort of joined together, but they both have additional frames um, hidden, and you need those frames to fade from one into the other so often people try and add a transition and for some reason that transition won't apply and the reason um, most likely is that there are no additional frames to apply the transition to which means that you've you've hit either the very end or the very beginning of one of those clips or even both maybe. So if you had the very end of this clip and the very beginning of this one then the transition just wouldn't apply at all because there are no frames at all to join to. Um, so you need additional frames um, to, to, uh, to apply transitions. So if I close this down here so all of these frames that were here are now my additional frames so if I now join these together, right click, apply default transitions, and now my cross dissolve goes over both clips. And I can extend or minimize my dissolve like I just uh, like you just saw there, just by dragging the edges of it. Or if I double click that cross dissolve, I can set a duration for it. Okay cancel that or just by going to the effects controls um, I can I can um, I can change the length of position of it the length of one side the length of the other side um, etc or I can change the position using these parameters as well um, so there you go, that is a cross dissolve. Um, and so that's how all transitions work. Um, they all work in exactly the same way. You need frames on both, both sides of the clip, on the incoming clip and the outgoing clip. Um, and you can change the, uh, the length of them in exactly the same way.
to get to your additional transitions, you can go into the effects tab at the top. And so this would normally look like this. And I would just go into video transitions. And I've got lots and lots of different transitions now. This one marked in blue is cross dissolve. And it's marked in blue because that is the default transition. So set selected as default transition. I could change that if I like. So I can just select whichever transition I want and set that as my default transition. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to use that as leave it as cross dissolve because that's the most common one. Um, you know, there are lots of fancy spins, twirls, zip zaps, whatever. Um, most of them are very dated and look awful. Um, so you, you're never going to use 99% of these, um, but the rest, uh, yeah, there's one or two useful ones, um, mainly dissolve, um, dip to blacks, dip to whites. Um, uh, so yeah, there you go. Um, that's how you would use uh, transitions. Oh, sorry. And if you just, if you want to add a transition to any other part of the clip, um, you literally just drag it from this folder, dip to white, drop that on there, and there you go. And again, I can extend that out, etc. Okay, so um, that is your transitions. Okay, so on to video filters and adjustment layers, and um, basically video effects. Um, so let's go into Premiere. So if we were going from our editing um, tab, so editing um, windows, and we want to find our video filters or effects if I want to apply an effect to a video clip again a couple of ways you can uh, you can get to the effects a couple of places you can find them um, you can either find them down in the uh, browser window down the bottom left click on these right arrows here and scroll to effects and then you have your list of effects and it's video effects that we're looking for. Or let's just go back to the project. Or if we go to the effects tab at the top, so our effects windows layout. And now over on the right hand side, this list here, you have uh, again your list of effects. And in these drop down menus here, you have your uh, video effects, a whole sort of uh, load of effects here. There's a little search bar in the top as well. Um, you, you might not be able to see this behind my picture, but um, search bar in there. If you know the name of your effect, I'll just put blur in there then I can find, it will search for uh, anything with the word blur in the effect and then I can add add that from there. Um, the, we have to watch out with these search bars is if you've got something typed in there it will hide everything else. So I might go and look for my video, uh, you know, a particular effect and because I've got blur in there at the moment um, it's going to hide everything that hasn't got blur in the title so I won't be able to find anything other than the blur um, so I just need to um, delete the search um, term before I can get the full list back um, so let's just choose one of these at random um, so let's just add this Gaussian blur and to to uh, add an effect or to apply an effect to your clip, you literally just um, find the effect in the list, select it, and drag 
that over down onto your clip and then double click the clip go over to effect controls and let's just close these down so we can see what's happening um, Gaussian blur is there now and I can add in uh, my effect with this slider um, so that's making it um, more blurry um, or I can do it with these numbers type in a specific number and there are different types of blur as well horizontal or vertical or both um, and again I can add this effect over time uh, so let's just find this again so I can animate this effect using keyframes uh, so blurriness let's put that down to zero again so that's totally sharp I'll put a keyframe in first keyframe I have to add with the uh, toggle animation button and then the second keyframe I can just add with this add and remove keyframe button and then while I'm over the second keyframe while my playhead is over this second keyframe if I just type in a number there uh, 100 enter and now that will sort of go from sharp to out of focus um, as it plays through okay um, so there you go that is how you add an effect to a clip so there is another way of adding um, video effects uh, in Premiere and this I'll show you that now so rather than add it to the actual clip itself you add it to a separate layer um, and this is called an adjustment layer um, and to do that let's just um, remove this effect for now so if I want to get rid of this blur altogether from that clip I can just select it in my effects controls backspace and delete it and it's gone okay um, actually before I do that if I decide that I really like that effect and I want to add it to all of the other clips in my film um, I want to make my entire film out of focus like you do um, then what I would do uh, there is a way to um, that you can add effects quickly to a whole load of um, clips at once and you just select the clip that the effect is on select that there and command C copy and then select the other clips that you want to um, paste the effect into um, select as many of those as you like and then you right click or control click and go paste attributes so this will paste the attributes of the clip that I've just copied a second ago. So if I select paste attributes and I've got a few effects in there already. So um, I, I can select which ones I want to add and which ones I don't want to add. Um, so this is just going to be the blur. I can also paste attributes with the motion effects and opacity as well. Um, so uh, yeah, you can do those as well. So let's just OK that and now I've got the blur effect on all of my clips and you'll notice that it didn't just take the effect, it took the, um, the keyframes as well. So the keyframe animation is also copied in the, um, in the paste attributes. Okay, so I'm just going to undo that. Command Z, undo. I'm going to get rid of my blur from that clip. 
Uh, so all my clips are without blur again. So I, I'm just sort of randomly showing you with uh, an effect, um, blur, for example. Um, but this works with absolutely any other effect. Um, so all of the effects uh, work in exactly the same way. You drop them on the clip, open them up in effects controls to get to the individual parameters of that effect. Um, and then you can also animate those parameters, uh, anyone that has the um, toggle uh, animation button you can add keyframe animation to. And also, like I said before, there's another way to add effects in Premiere, and that's using adjustment layers. So um, to create an adjustment layer, I have to go file new adjustment layer um, I think I can also go right click in my browser new item adjustment layer there you go and I get the adjustment layer window and again these are taken from my sequence settings so I generally don't want to um, you know add something that's taken from my sequence settings uh, that's different. So I'm just gonna leave those settings as they are and click okay. And I have my adjustment layer down here. Okay, um, so I can put that adjustment layer into a new bin. Okay. And you can imagine if I start adding quite a few effects, eventually I'm going to start building up quite a few of these adjustment layers if I'm going to work like that. Um, and if they're all called adjustment layer, then, then that's not going to be very helpful to me. So I'm going to need to uh, label these with something that's a bit more useful. Um, so let's just call this blur um, and so now what I want to do is I want to get my adjustment layer into my edit so let's just drag it over and in and so at the moment let's just leave that where it is and add the blur to the adjustment layer so rather than now dragging the effect onto the clip I'm going to drag it onto the adjustment layer and if I double click go to effects controls then there it is that's my blur and if I increase the blurriness then that's what I end up with on so basically what it does is it will apply the effect to any clip which is underneath um, that adjustment layer. Um, so you'll notice with this one, as soon as the adjustment layer runs out, the effect stops. Um, but I can just extend that out if I want to. And I can edit this adjustment layer in the same way as uh, I, I can with any other clip, you know, I can add cuts and fades and all that sort of thing. So yeah, the handy thing about that is obviously if I want to go back and see what my clip was like without um, that adjustment layer on, I can just, just t take it out of the way. Um, or if it's just a temporary thing, um, maybe a bit of temporary colour correction before it actually goes off to be colour graded. Um, I can just apply it there and then just remove it. Um, if I just backspace from the sequence, then it's deleted from there, but it's still in my um, my project. Undo that and bring that back. So, uh, and yeah, if I if I discovered that, um, you know, I might apply it to one clip, and then if I decide that I want to add that to all the other clips rather than have to go through the sort of um, copy and, and paste attributes, I can just literally extend that um, 
and it will apply to any clip um, which is underneath it. Okay, and that's adjustment layers. I don't think there's anything else I need to say about those. Um, I can I can uh, animate with keyframes in the adjustment layer in the same way as I can on the clip. Um, so there you go. That's effects, video filters. Um, like I said, uh, applying effects to uh, to clips works in exactly the same way for pretty much all of these effects. Um, so yeah, okay. So let's go back to Lumetri, so color grading. Um, like I said, I, I'm not going to go into detail um, on how to color grade. Uh, I'm just going to show you how the color grading tool works in Premiere. Um, color grading is a whole subject in itself. Uh, and there will be further color grading tutorials um, that will help you with the actual process of color grading. Um, so for now, Lumetri, back into Premiere. Um, let's just get rid of this uh, blur effect. And I'll just go with this clip here for a bit of color grading. So in the same way that there is a, a tab for some of the other processes, there's also a color tab. So if I click on color, and what I end up with is um, this Lumetri color panel over on the right hand side. Um, and importantly here, I've got this Lumetri scopes. Um, so it may not initially open with the scopes, but they are there. It's just a matter of selecting, selecting them in the uh, in the heading at the top there. Um, so let's, if I hover over my clip here with the playhead, so whichever clip I have selected is the one that the color grading will be applied to. Uh, and you can also apply color grading to uh, adjustment layers as well. And in fact, um, color grading is a good example of, of, of uh, how adjustment layers um, are quite good to use in, in your workflow. Um, so let's go for, let's go for one, shall we? So let's file, new, ah, my adjustment layer is grayed out. Can anybody remember why that is? So you may remember from earlier tutorials, um, whichever window I have selected will determine uh, what access I have to some of the menu items. So I need to have my project browser selected to go File, New, Adjustment Layer. Okay, and keep those parameters adjustment layer and let's just call this um, color grade one um, if I was doing something specific you know if this was a project then I'd probably know uh, what kind of color grading I was about to do so I'd be a bit more descriptive than than just that um, but this is just a test so uh, we can either put that in with the rest of our adjustment layers, or we could even create a new color grading bin and add that there. Um, but either way, I'm still going to need to put my adjustment layer over into my timeline. So let's pop that in there. And now, this is one thing you also have to. Uh, um, be, be careful of. Um, so if I click on my um, playhead, you'll notice that my clip is selected rather than the adjustment layer. So if I start doing any color grading now, 
then that is going to be applied to the clip and not the adjustment layer. Even though the adjustment layer is there, um, it's going to apply it to the um, to the clip because the clip is selected. So I need to select my adjustment layer for any changes that I make to be applied to that adjustment layer and not the clip. Um, so uh, these headings here are all a different set of tools um, and like I said I'm not going to go into exactly how each of these work um, because that's uh, a, a whole separate um, tutorial in itself um, but what I will say is the color wheels are usually the, the place to start when you're doing uh, color grading especially if it's contrast adjustments and sort of color balance adjustments or you know a, a white balance fixes or something like that for example um, you'd start with the color wheels um, okay you can also you know because in color grading what the, the essentially the workflow is um, you do your primary grade first and then your secondary grade so the primary grade would be fixing contrast and fixing white balance and then the secondary grade would be adding any uh, any sort of stylistic content or flares and things like that um, so you could even use separate adjustment layers for primary and secondary and you could even use a whole load of adjustment layers you know you could use one for contrast one for color uh, one for effects you know as many as you like you can just stack them up um, however I'm just going to use one for now uh, and if I want to do a, do a contrast adjustment on my uh, clip so I'm going to go to uh, color wheels and you'll notice that there is three color wheels in here there's one for the shadows one for the midtones and one for the highlights I think that's fairly obvious what they do um, but there's also so there's a color wheel for each one of those and there's also this little slider for each one of those as well so um, the color wheels affect the color of the shadows midtones and highlights and the sliders affect the contrast of the shadows, midtones, and highlights. So if I want to increase the contrast in this image, um, it's already quite a high contrast image, so I wouldn't necessarily want to do that, but just to show you how to do it, um, what I would do is um, make the, the, the blacks uh, stand out more, so kind of... Um, more intense blacks and you do that by dragging this slider down so making the blacks darker <clears throat> and then the highlights I would push those up and that's increasing the highlights and then maybe you could either push the midtones up or down depending on what the overall brightness you are after is for your clip. Um, so anyway, there's a bit of additional contrast in there. Um, this little tick box here, I can tick that on and off. And that shows you basically what you've done. Just there, so you can see uh, the difference between where you started and where you are now. Um, so uh, that's how you add contrast adjustments, color adjustments. Um, for example, imagine this was a clip with the uh, with the white balance all wrong, um, and uh, if this clip was sort of too orange which it might be if it had a, uh, you know, the, uh, the white balance wrong, um, or it could be too blue. Um, if it's an outdoor, or, uh, sorry, if it's an external clip, it's more likely to be um, blue. Um, so if it's too blue, what you do is you go to the mid-tones color wheel and you 
grab this crosshair in the middle and shift it away from the blue and that will start removing the blue from your image and balancing it out better so making it more natural um, obviously that there wasn't anything really wrong with that white balance so um, this is kind of having the opposite effect um, but imagine you started there like that and the clip was too orange again what you do is you go to the crosshairs and move the mid-tones crosshair away from the orange and towards the blue and then that would start looking more natural okay so whatever color balance problem you have you take the mid-tone slider uh, sorry the mid-tones uh, color wheel and move it away from that color that you're having a problem with um, and that should do the trick if you're finding that it's still not working properly you might need to do a little bit the same with the highlights and maybe even the shadows um, more likely to be a, a bit of a uh, additional color balance with the highlights than the shadows um, but it depends how bad it is I suppose um, so yeah that's how you do sort of basic contrast and color adjustments um, using the uh, color wheels um, in Lumetri um, but also so how do I know that I'm moving them by the right amount you know how do I know if I'm not going too far or or how do I know that I'm not underexposing my image or overexposing my image so that's where these scopes come in over here um, it, it looks mind-boggling when you first see a scope um, but all you have to think about is the the left to right pixels are all in the right positions um, but the up and down um, pixels the vertical pixels are distributed by um, contrast or brightness rather than actual physical position uh, so um, what that means is when you play through the image you can sort of recognize where it's moving you can kind of see if you look over in the far left when those branches from the little tree start to come into the image you can actually see that in the scopes so you can you can actually recognize parts of the image in the scope um, but importantly what's going on in the scope is we need to be looking right at this top layer so up at 100% and, and down at zero so none of our image should be below zero and none of it should be above 100 um, and in actual fact what will happen is when you hit those um, zero and 100 marks uh, it, it, it won't go any further than that anyway um, but what it does do is it starts crushing it out, starts flattening it, starts clipping it basically, so it's clipping your image. So you can see that down at the bottom here, at zero, a lot of our image is hitting this zero line. And that means that any place where we hit zero, we have clipped this image, we've made it... Um, uh, we, we've basically lost any detail in that in those black areas down there and if I keep going with this you'll kind of see that it gets really black in certain places and you can't make out anything that's going on in there so that is now clipped in the black levels um, it's underexposed and you can kind of see that uh, on the zero we've got signal hitting that zero line almost all the way along there now um, so what you'd need to do is push those shadows back up until they come out of the 
zero line. Um, so you might also now be able to see that even along this zero line now, we still have some of our, um, they're called graticules, these kind of little tiny dots that make up this image here. Um, there are still some graticules along the edge of the zero line. So this kind of blue uh, line that it's sort of left there means that we've still got some of our image is hitting the zero line. So what I'd have to do is I'd have to push the shadows pretty high before we start to lose those graticules along there. And I'm, I'm purely looking at the scopes now. I'm not looking at the image at the moment. So now that is telling me that I've got no part of my image is underexposed. But when I go over to my image now, um, it's I've kind of lost the contrast in it altogether. You know, it's kind of really starting to look quite grey and washed out now. Um, and that's not what I want either. So it, it's just a ma matter of getting the balance right. Um, basically what's happened, where you can see this line here, it's kind of been underexposed slightly when it was shot. So um, those underexposed areas uh, are showing up in, this, in the scopes just here. Um, and to try and get rid of them, I'm having to push it too far. Um, and uh, so it's starting to, you know, I'm losing the contrast in the image. So it's just a matter of finding that right balance between, um, you know, actually clipping a part of your image and, um, and making the contrast look natural. Uh, so, yeah, it's just a matter of getting that balance right, basically. Ideally, you would make sure that you don't have any of your image um, clipped, but that's not always possible um, due to the way that it, it may well have been shot in the first place, um, especially when you're perhaps working with uh, footage that was shot on a mobile phone like this was. Um, okay, so the same goes for the top end actually, 100%. Um, and in fact, it's probably more important at the at the 100% end of the scale so at the at the whites end of the scale um simply because whites uh, are obviously brighter um and they 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 catch your eye more um so therefore you tend to be drawn to them more than the the dark areas therefore you're going to notice overexposed bright white areas more than you would underexposed dark areas um in general generally speaking um so um again we're not doing too badly here actually um there is some areas of my image slightly touching the 100 percent line and that's probably up in the sky just here some of these clouds might be just touching the the overexposed um the clipping um 100 percent line and potentially maybe some of this white uh area here too um, so I can drag down the highlights just to make sure and you can see now that um, even though this sky is you know generally is quite bright um, we can still see all the details there we can still see all the clouds if I push the highlights the other way you'll see what happens so the graticules start to sort of flatten out at the top. Everything goes, uh, you know, sort of um, flattens out into a line at the top. And now the sky in my image has pretty much just gone white. Um, so there's now no detail in this sky, hardly. Um, it's just bright, white, clipped image. Um, and that's generally not what we want. So if I bring that back down, 
we start to see the detail of the clouds come back and that's a much nicer image to look at okay um, so that's how your scopes work um, these are called waveforms um, and this is an RGB waveform you can see the red green and the blue channel all there um, in one or mixed together um, if you look down at the uh, little spanner menu down the bottom and we can select different types of uh, scopes so there's a waveform there's a parade so the parade is in actual fact so let actually let's turn the waveform off and the parade is exactly the same as the waveform but with the red green and blue channels separated so now you can see each one of those channels separately and you can kind of see which one might be clipping so this this is kind of handy sometimes because you might think well okay I need to push up my entire image all of my contrast to get rid of the clipping in the in the darks uh, in the black area but in actual fact it's mostly the blue here that's clipping so I might be able to just get away with raising the levels of the blue channel uh, again I'm not going to go into all of that now because it's uh, yes, not enough time here. Um, so yeah, you've got the parade, uh, which is the RGB version of the waveform. You have a histogram. Let's turn the parade off. The histogram uh, just shows you black to white and how the the detail in the image and colors and brightness in the image is spread throughout that 0 to 100% mark. Then you have vector scope. And this uh, is showing me colors actually. So if you look here, you've got the, the red, uh, red, green, and blue primary colors, and then um, yellow, cyan, and magenta secondary colors. Um, and wherever these graticules are sort of leaning towards is telling you that that is the overall color balance in your image so uh, they're going to yellow quite a lot and a little bit towards red and towards green as well certainly they're over this side of the color wheel um, and that's because the, in actual fact there's a lot of yellow in green um, green grass actually has quite a lot of yellow in it um, and there's a lot of green grass in this image so uh, there's quite a high yellow count there um, and a bit of red sort of red bricks in the building um, sort of reddish track uh, a few little bits of red here and there um, and then obviously green as well um, so you can kind of tell what colors are going to be an image in, in an image by looking at the um, the vector scope. So there are two versions of the vector scope um, and uh, they kind of show you this, the same thing basically. Um, so again, yeah, it's a bit too much detail to go into there for now. So what I will do is just go back to the waveform because this is probably the one that's going to be most useful to you. Um, so yeah, uh, so there you go, there's a Lumetri tool with the waveform uh, scopes. Okay. There we go, there's the end of uh, the video tutorial. There's one more thing that I wanted to show you actually, so I'm just going to go back into Premiere. So um, as you're working on effects, you'll notice that um, what we have is this line above your clips, which is yellow. Um, and the more effects you add, uh, this line can change color. Uh, there's uh, a few different colors. Um, red is another one. Um, it's mostly red 
yellow or green actually um, so I suppose it's a bit of a traffic light thing red is is bad um, red means that um, it might not actually play your clip um, because you might have piled too many effects on yellow means that um, you've got some effects on there but it's um, it's it's okay it will play and green means that it's playing back at full quality full frame rate and it's really happy so before it's rendered the computer is playing the video track then it's applying the effects in real time and processing all of that information as it plays back on the fly that's why it might be struggling a bit um, you know trying to play things back uh, and what happens when you render the effect is you basically sort of export that clip, um, consolidate all of those effects into the clip. So it, all it needs to do is play back that, um, that rendered clip and it's not applying effects as it goes. If you export um, these clips when the line is not green, then they will be exported uh, not at full quality as well so that means your export will be a kind of low quality um, version so you have to do a full render before you do your final export but what you might find is that as you're piling effects on um, then playback will start to struggle and if that happens and if you get some of these lines going red then you might find that you have to render the um, render your clips even before you get to the export stage. Okay, and to do that, if you say I needed to export this little section here, I can just select put an in and out point there. It doesn't have to be precise. I can put in point here, out point there. Uh, so I did that using uh, I. And O, I, and O, and then I go up to sequence and render into out. Select that, and that will render those clips for me. Okay. For some reason, it starts to automatically play as soon as the render is finished. But now you can see that that line is green, and these will be playing back now at a hundred percent full quality. Okay. Um, if I want to get rid of my in and out points in here now, I can just control click or right click in this top ruler bar, clear in and out. So that's all I want to say about titles and effects for now. Um, thanks for watching the Premiere Video Tutorial Part 3. Uh, look out for Part 4, which is uh, sound mixing, and then Part 5, um, finishing and exporting. Okay, thank you very much.